my student friends, my teacher friends, and lovers and haters of rhetorical analysis. Christian Kuhn coming at you again, affectionately known as the Bob Ross of Composition. And I got a cool one for you today. So Jelly Roll's Senate address about the fentanyl crisis in America. So I'm going to make this kind of a quasi student facing, teacher facing piece because it's not anchored in any um, like college board prompt. So I'm going to kind of multitask. Two birds, one stone on that. So just so that you know, in the description, you have access to the speech. So we transcribe that for you. You have access to the slides that I'm going to show you in just a second. And you also have a YouTube link to the actual video of Jelly Roll delivering his address. So without further ado, let us take a look at the prompt that I cobbled together for you. Pretty basic. I always, when I make rhetorical analysis prompts, even if I'm doing it for like my on-level juniors, I try to get everything anchored in an FRQ2 sort of verbiage and parlance. So that's what I'm doing here. Very basic, just average run-of-the-mill prompt. So here it is. Rapper and country music star Jelly Roll gave powerful Senate testimony on the country's fentanyl crisis and called for tougher legislation to curb it. The musician, whose real name is Jason DeFord, told the Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee hearing on January 11th, 2024, how he had been personally impacted by the drug. Read the passage carefully. Write an essay that analyzes the rhetorical choices DeFord makes to convey his message. All right, before I Bob Ross all of this for you, just want to say, please subscribe. The channel is growing exponentially, which absolutely tickles me. So tell your friends, tell your colleagues, spread the word far and wide about Christian Kuhn, the Bob Ross of composition. So this is our new YouTube channel, and I'll be using this uh, exclusively going forward. So we're staring at a blank screen, a blank piece of paper, blank canvas, and we have to ask ourselves the question, so how do I write the intro? And for those that are familiar with my work, you know that for rhetorical analysis, I always advise my kids to declare the thesis. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to Bob Ross my instruction, and here's what I mean by that. I'm gonna to get to the proverbial easel in Canvas and paint a whole bunch of declarative theses for you. And teacher friends, this is how you demystify writing for your students so that they instinctively, intuitively know how to tackle an essay every single time you assign it. And the key is this, heuristics really work. Above and beyond templates, which I find to be a little bit too paint by number if we overburden kids with sentence stems, heuristics give kids a nice little structure or a training wheel, a scaffold to house their thinking. So you're going to see here in my exemplars, kids aren't wetted or bogged down by any sentence stems whatsoever. They have to create their original organic thinking on paper. But I got some secret news for you, a security breach here. When you take a look at prompts like what I just did for you, and you can go all the way back to like the 1970s for this with AP language prompts. Implicit in the language of my prompt, I'm really asking two questions. And the first is, how does the author construct meaning? And the second is, what is the authorial intent? <clears throat> and I'm going to model this for you because it can get a little pie in the sky and wavy gravy just bloviating about it. So what my students do <clears throat> is take three sentences to answer the question, how does the author construct meaning? And when you answer that question, you really got to get anchored in terms, devices, techniques. And I tell my students, typically, it's like three terms, devices, techniques that construct the meaning. So like syntax alone does not construct meaning. Ethos alone does not construct meaning. The pieces hold hands with each other in like jigsaw piece connect. So usually it's like three things that need to be woven together to ascertain the construction of meaning. And then I have them throw in one sentence about authorial intent. 
And that's just the universal truthiness of the piece, the universal theme, the exigence of it. So the introduction is going to take exactly four sentences. So my guys do three sentences, construction of meaning, one sentence, authorial intent. But really, before you get writing, it's all contingent upon the reading. I teach my kids how to read extensively and exhaustively. I don't teach any full length text in AP language. We only do small things, lots of speeches, lots of short excerpts. And I skill and drill the reading because students really need to get in there and go hunting for the terms, the devices, the techniques. Jelly Roll is doing certain things rhetorically that no matter how good of a writer your student is, they're going to tank bomb this portion of the exam if they misread or don't thoroughly read everything that is, you know, really essential to the piece. So let's break down the declarative thesis graphically. I often use triangles to describe my heuristics for my introductory paragraphs. So I use declarative thesis and inverted thesis and the inverted you just flip the triangle upside down. So let's break down all the minutia that goes in here. One, you're gonna begin with the thesis. Whenever a student answers the question about construction of meaning, that constitutes and comprises the thesis. So we're gonna lead with that. And we're gonna have three sentences that really get to the construction of meaning. You gotta bring in a little bit of context and background. By extension, you're gonna talk about theme just a little bit, but you don't wanna get into a plot recitation of what Jelly Roll did during the address, like a play-by-play -play announcer for a sports broadcasting. Um, the other thing you want to do is sprinkle in a little bit of tier two level vocabulary. And what I mean by that is just your average run of the mill SAT level caliber words. So I'm going to model that. And of course, students, I'm speaking to you on this. Don't get, you know, waylaid by the notion that if you use a million, million dollar words, that that's the equivalent of doing good writing. Stay in your wheelhouse, stay in your lane, sound natural, you know, really hone in on your voice. Sentence constructs are a biggie for me. So I explicitly teach the 12 sentence types and the 20 sentence patterns. Students and teachers, I have many videos in my YouTube channel that go over that. So I want my students to be syntactical ninjas as they approach their voice, their rhythm flow. So I'll model that, right? You gotta do good modeling. And as I've already alluded to, it's gonna be four sentences. So before we dive in, let's break down the math. Three sentences, construction of meaning, one sentence, authorial intent. So let's take a look at exemplar number one. I'll read it and then I'll break it down uh, and tell you all the bit parts that go into it. So here it is from the top. From the pain and triumph of his own personal experience, Jelly Roll addresses the Senate committee with a sense of urgency and desperation. Primarily through anecdote, DeFord implores the representatives to act swiftly for the fentanyl epidemic rages in America without mercy or discrimination. Equipped with the relevant statistics and data points, the case is laid out simply. The Senate has a moral obligation to intervene on behalf of the people they are caretakers of. With utmost humility and sincerity, Jelly Roll underscores the irony of his remarks, but his personal spin on the topic overrides the apparent contradiction. So one of the things I do in terms of uh, construction of meaning <coughs> is I tell my students to teeter-totter balance the explicit and implicit use of terms, devices, techniques. And here's my rule for them. If you explicitly state it in your introduction, you probably want to imply it in the first premise so as not to be redundant or reiterative and vice versa if you imply go explicit in the uh, in the first premise so let's break down what i have in here so if you if you look at that first sentence from the pain and triumph of his own personal experience jelly roll addresses the senate committee with a sense of urgency and desperation, right? So I'm kind of getting to the tone of it a little bit, but that's also the universal truth in many ways, primarily through anecdote. So I expressly said it there. So anecdote is one of the key ingredients for the construction of meaning. 
DeFord implores the representatives to act swiftly for the fentanyl epidemic rages in America without mercy or discrimination. So all along here, you're going to do a little bit of context and background with a thematic umbrella concept over everything. And then look at this next part here. Equipped with the relevant statistics and data points. That's how he builds his ethos. So I'm in ethos there. And then with utmost humility and sincerity, that's also ethos. And then I expressly state underscores the irony of his remarks and overrides the apparent contradiction. So I got three terms, devices, techniques in there and a little bit of focus on the authorial intent. And that's how you do the three plus one. You can see that my vocab is up. You know, there's good verbiage in here. Um, the sentence constructs are all varied. Students and teachers, I'll say this to the two of you, one, one rule of thumb that I have in my classroom, especially for introductory paragraphs, there is seldom, seldom, seldom a need to parallel your sentences in the introduction right? You usually don't parallel at all. And the, the tendency of struggling and emerging writers is they over rely on independent clauses. So you get this dot, 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 dot kind of rhythm or cadence to it. You don't want to do that. So pay attention to the sentence you just dropped and run like hell from it. Avoid that pattern for a little bit. Otherwise, you're going to be repetitive, redundant, and have too much parallelism going on. So that's one example of three plus one. Let's do it again. Let me dial it back and I'll take it from the top just like I did with number one. So let me read it and then I'll unpack it. While the irony is quite manifest, a former incarcerated drug dealer is perhaps the best advocate for the American people to implore the Senate committee to act promptly to address the fentanyl crisis. Jelly Roll, a bit of a contradiction in and of himself, proves himself to be the perfect mouthpiece to speak on behalf of the American people as he has witnessed firsthand the devastating consequences of the drug loophole. Principally through anecdote, his simplicity and humility add a certain credibility to his remarks. Mindful did not present as a celebrity, Jelly Roll embraces the persona of your typical American citizen impacted by the current drug epidemic. Let's identify the terms, the devices, the techniques. I said irony. I said anecdote. When I say credibility, I'm at ethos, right? So I got my three in there. My vocab is up. All right, good, good verbiage again, you know, good diction without overdoing it. I don't don't want to overcook the vocab so that I sound pretentious or contrived. I always got to like be in range of my natural voice. And that's good for students to be mindful of, too. <clears throat> and then yet again, all the sentence constructs are very and note, because I've had comments from students in the past on this, again, you don't need to go willy nilly with semicolons and dashes and ellipses and all that stuff. I just use commas in this, right, to break it up, to change the, you know, the direction of the cadence and the flow. So students might be saying, Christian, this is three plus one stuff is hard. Oh, yes, you can. You can do it. Let me show it to you one more time. I'm going to go the exact same route. Three plus one paradigm declarative thesis. In his attempt to implore the Senate committee to act with a sense of urgency, Jelly Roll delivers his remarks not as a noteworthy celebrity, but as an ironic sufferer and conqueror of the current fentanyl crisis. So we'll break it down as we go. I said irony, but I'm also into his ethos. Casting himself with sheer humility and sincerity, that's more ethos, he approaches the issue with pertinent statistics, that's again ethos, and anecdotes, I said it, to underscore his exigence, I said it. Pointing out the responsibility of the community of the committee that they have a duty to protect and serve the American citizenry, he subtly hints that the government is coming up short in fulfilling their oaths. With simple language, Jelly Roll boils down the issue to a simple point. The Senate must take swift action in order to protect America from this raging crisis. And there's always three plus one vocab up, sentence structures are flowing, right? No redundancy at sentence level. You can do that every time. No matter what prompt you throw at me or my, or my students, this is what we do systematically. So imagine over time, like I just skill and drill my students with rhetorical analysis. It's just boom, boom, boom. They know instinctively, intuitively, habitually how to nail these 
um, introductory paragraphs. So if you're painting along with me, probably a good place to pause. Students give it a whirl. Teachers, maybe you write a couple of exemplars and show them how to do it just to unpack it a little more. So intro's done. We got to ask ourselves the next question. So how do I write the body paragraphs? And as always, you're going to proceed syllogistically. In my other videos, I go over the syllogistic method exhaustively. So you might want to backtrack if you're new to this heuristic, but I'll give a cursory sort of fly-by-night overview of it. So it's rooted in the Aristotelian tradition. Aristotle thunked it up. He ran a school called the Lyceum, and the aristocratic boys would go there to learn about wordsmithing, word wrangling, oration, polemic debates, and they would often throw out these juicy essential questions, which we still see today in some of the seminal texts like Plato's Republic. What is justice? And the think tankers and the philosophers, the scholars would step to the proverbial mic and they would drop their definition. And Aristotle, like us composition teachers, was principally concerned with line of reasoning. He called it cogency. And he said, why is it that some students are mo more cogent than other and their others and therefore make better arguments? And one day he had a eureka moment and he said, aha, I got it. the kids who are really good at cloaking their arguments proceed syllogistically. And all it is is like a mathematical computative formula that goes premise, premise, conclusion. So if I say premise one, arsenic is deadly. You all would nod your head and say, yep, Christian's 100% correct. If I follow it up and say premise two, my dog ate arsenic, you're all going to naturally, you know, logically conclude Christian's dog's going to die. Like eating arsenic does not bode well for a dog. And Aristotle would call that a cogent argument. So how do we take that heuristic and morph it into something to help us make our body paragraphs for the purposes of performing rhetorical analysis. Here it is. First premise, we have to make an argument, right? Because we gotta keep in mind, this is an act of expository writing. So we're gonna argue, but we have to argue using terms, devices, techniques. This is always a three sentence move. And I'll reiterate that. It's a three sentence move. I'll model it for you in just a sec. Fourth sentence begins the second premise, and this is where you want to teeter-totter balance your quoting and paraphrasing. You don't want to do one far more at the expense of the other. And then body paragraphs need conclusions. You just don't want to end on a quote and abandon your thought. You got to wrap it all back to the thesis, the prompt, and then keep the promise of the first premise. And I'll show you how to do this all step by step. So let's do a first premise just to see what it looks like. I have very few sentence stems for my students. I'm not a big fan of them. But early in the academic year, students often ask me this question, where do I begin my analysis? And my tacit response is, start where jelly roll starts and indicate to your reader that you have a chronology, that you have a system in place, that you're going to methodically analyze the speech. So the sentence stem is actually a sentence clause is right from the onset comma. My students often use that. And again, it's just, it gets the reader's antennae up and they're like, oh, this kid's organized. This kid's gonna stay cogent. This kid knows how to write a line of reasoning. So my students often steal that from me. So I start where jelly roll starts and look at this. Right from the onset, DeFord distances himself from his celebrity and presents as quite human and grounded. But he then couples this aspect of his ethos with some sobering statistics to add credence to his plea. Feeling the need to address the proverbial elephant in the room from the start, Jelly Roll embraces the apparent irony of his forthcoming remarks by acknowledging his past actions. So my students don't do this, which I think is too dutiful and immature at the AP level. They don't do. They don't do one paragraph tone, one paragraph syntax, one paragraph diction, etc. You can see in here some implicit and explicit. So you know that I promise, because the first promise is a promise, I have to analyze this ethos, I have to analyze the irony, and by extension of this, I'm also going to get into his logos a little bit. 
that's what I mean by multitasking. Again, you're going to keep the vocab up. Always, always, always focus on those sentence constructs. So just to recap that, the first premise is three sentences. Start where the author starts. Now, in terms of how I proceed from here, I have to go quote hunting. I, I, I have, um, you know, made promises in my first premise and I have to keep those promises in order to keep my line of reasoning intact. So what's the promise of the first premise, right? Well, go back to that first premise. Everything, in order to keep my line of reasoning intact, I have to have quotes and or paraphrases for everything that I implicitly or explicitly commented on in that first premise. So let's jump into the second premise and see how I wield my pen. Immediately, his diction is humbling and gives him a quality of approachable humility as he asks for forgiveness for being a little nervous. So fourth sentence, I usually start quoting. And you can see that the first thing I promised in my first premise was ethos. So I got to start with ethos. And in terms of quote transitions, I use something called the five word rule. And I just have my students use a minimum, so not exactly, a minimum of five words in front of the quote. Keep the quote small. It should sound conversational. So I'm hunkered in on the ethos. I quoted, I got to analyze it. So look where I go. On the Senate floor, he does not want to be jelly rolled, the man who's used to having a rock and roll band behind him when he has a microphone in front of him. But conversely, he wants to be the true and authentic Jason Ford, DeFord, a formerly incarcerated addict and drug dealer. Again, I'm still in ethos. To contextualize his, his allotted five minutes <coughs> to address the Senate floor, he underscores the fact that within this brief span of time, somebody in the United States will die of a drug overdose and it will be fentanyl related, right? So the statistics are also part of the ethos. So I've thoroughly covered ethos. I got to move on. I got I to get out of there. Jelly Roll from the start notes two key points of irony. And that was something I promised in my first premise. First, that the fentanyl crisis seems to have partisan allegiance to the current political divide. And second, DeFord must acknowledge the paradox of his history as a drug dealer. In coupling these two things, Jelly Roll notes that while he once was the problem, he now wants to be part of the solution. So I'm out of space here. I got to go on to the next page. And typically, a syllogistic body paragraph is like 10 to 12 sentences long. Those little itty bitty four or five sentence baggers that kids do for the exam, I really don't think bode well for them. There's not enough support or analysis in there. So I still made, I made a couple of other promises in my first premise, and I got to get there. In stating this, the point is clear. The Senate is now the problem because they have been dragging their heels to take action to address the epidemic. To tie everything together, DeFord provides the Senate with a heartbreaking analogy. The fact that 190 people a day die of a fentanyl overdose, the number of people of what a 737 aircraft can carry. His rhetorical question is poignant and logically conclusive. Could you imagine the national media attention it would get if they were reporting that a plane was crashing every single day and killing 190 people? So that I'm like, I'm staying so tight in my line of reasoning. Everything that I promised in the first premise, in the second premise, I either have a quote and or paraphrase for it. But I'm not done. You got to wrap this up. You got to cross the finish line. And usually the conclusion just takes like two sentences. So look how this goes all the way back to the prompt, all the way back to the thesis, all the way back to the first premise. And taking this approach, Jelly Roll solidifies his point. The Senate committee needs to act with a greater sense of urgency. Too much is at stake and too many have already been lost. And that, my friends, is an entire syllogistic body paragraph. You can see there, that's a super locked in. And Aristotle would say, yup, Christian, that is cogent. Well done. Again, if you're writing with me, teacher, students, pause. Give your hand at that first premise. Start from the top. Steal the stem right from the onset or use something closely akin to it. And then go cherry picking your quotes and paraphrases, sprinkle them in with the five word rule, make sure you drop a conclusion in there as well. So we have an intro, 
in one body paragraph done, the question becomes this, what do I do next? And it's easy. You bust out another syllogism. My students write four paragraphs for all FRQs for both Lang and Lit. Intro, two bodies, conclusion. So as we move into this uh, second body paragraph, we have to ask ourselves what's left. So let me help students out and uh, tell you what I would analyze. He uses the colloquial expression, you all, quite a bit. I got to get it into the diction of that. That's a very important linguistic rhetorical feature. The other thing that I haven't touched upon yet all that much are the personal anecdotes. So I'm going to just really be specific in my paragraph and talk about the anecdote of the ex-wife, the daughter, and his father. I haven't really hit upon syntax above and beyond that one rhetorical question. So I want to talk specifically about the fragmented sentence structure in the fourth paragraph. I think that's really important syntactical feature. And then there are a few juxtapositions that he makes. Crack cocaine in comparison to fentanyl and then his proactive or reactive logos um, that he talks about at the end. And that's everything that would go into my second body paragraph. But we ain't done because I said that it's a four paragraph essay. We got to wrap the essay up. My students use some conclusion stems and I'm going to give you the, the following caveat to this early in the academic year. Eventually, I want these training wheels off. It's too much of a scaffold and it's a little too artificial. But here's how I explain conclusions to my students early in the year. It's kind of like going to a fireworks display and seeing the grand finale. That's what the conclusion paragraph is, the grand finale. So you want to hammer home theme, exigence, universal truth. And it only takes a couple of sentences. So here, well, I should qualify that. It, I usually do it in three or four sentences. So here are a few of our favorite conclusion stems. Simply said, evidentially, in no other words, when it's all said and done and at the end of the day. So let me model for you one that I did. So another stem that we use is at the end of the day. And uh, especially for speeches that tend to be informal, like jelly rolls, this is a good way to conclude. So at the end of the day, jelly roll highlights the fact that only the Senate committee can meaningfully address the fentanyl crisis in our country. Their inaction has already resulted in countless senseless deaths. To not act quickly is tantamount to willfully killing citizens, something wholly contradictory of the oath these men and women took when they swore to serve their constituents. Just three sentences and wrap it all up. All right, that's it, teachers, students, friends, colleagues. Happy teaching, happy writing. If you have any questions whatsoever, I always answer my emails every day, and you can drop me a note at teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. Also note that I'm a lead teacher for NWP, a frequent face at NCTE and the college board. And uh, if you want to stay abreast of the PD offerings that I offer through NWP, you can visit my website at www.teachinghowtowrite.com. Most are free. Some are for a nominal fee. Uh, sometimes I, I do little webinars for perfection learning throughout the calendar year. Those are always free. And then students, I am expert on the college personal statement uh, portion of the application for college admissions. Been doing it for 22 years. I used to work admissions at Brown. I did my graduate studies there. So especially if you're applying to really good schools, I can be a helping hand to you with your supplements and personal statements and the whole process. I also can get you over the hump of AP Lang and AP Lit. Uh, been teaching those courses for over two decades. I'm a seasoned veteran. Don't have any gray hair yet, but I'm a seasoned veteran. And my company is called Write at Ivy Right. So if you want more information on that, drop me an email and I'll be happy to work with you. So that's it from here. That's the end. I'll come at you with more videos in the coming days and weeks. Be well. Take care.